and welcome to the 7th Alexander Duff Memorial Lecture 2020 the most prestigious lecture organized by Scottish Church College i am dr samrat bhattacharya ji the iqac coordinator of scottish church college and your host for today's program since 2013 the college has been holding the lecture which is delivered by an eminent personality and dedicated to the former founder reverend dr alexander duff carrying the legacy today we have with us professor deepesh chakraborty the lawrence a kinton distinguished service professor in history south asian languages and civilizations at the university of chicago usa to speak on a rather interesting topic the planetary age in human history we also have with us the principal of scottish church college dr rokita mukherjee and vice principal dr shukrutin das for the inaugural session before we begin may i request you all to switch off your camera and mute your audio for the entire duration of the program should you have any question for the speaker please type it in the chat box professor chakraborty will address them during the question and answer session which will be moderated by dr shrimal guho thakurta of history department the entire session today is being live telecast on youtube and will be recorded without any further delay may i now request our principal dr rokita mukherjee to deliver her formal welcome address thank you dr bhattacharya professor deepesh chakraborty lawrence a kimton distinguished service professor in history south asian languages and civilizations university of chicago our distinguished speaker dr sk mukuti secretary college council dr shupratim das vice principal Dr. Shomrat Bhattacharya, IQAC coordinator, dignitaries in the audience, former teachers, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, and my dear students, it is my privilege and honor to welcome you all to the seventh Alexander Duff Memorial Lecture. This is a prestigious lecture that the college organizes each year in memory of its founder, Reverend Dr. Alexander Duff. the first overseas missionary of the church of scotland in india whose contribution to education was outstanding this year on account of the pandemic we've been compelled to meet on a virtual platform which has enabled us to reach out to a much larger audience across the country and across the world the first of the duff lectures was delivered by a distinguished alumnus of the college the then governor of odisha dr s c jamir it is our tradition to be addressed by some eminent personality for this lecture we have been addressed by sri johor sarkar the then ceo prasar bharti claimed social historian professor bikash sinha former director shah institute of nuclear physics professor uma dashgupto distinguished historian and leading expert in tagore studies Professor Polash Boron Pal, eminent physicist, writer, linguist, and poet, and Professor Shekhar Bandopadhyay, noted historian. Today, I especially welcome Professor Deepesh Chakraborty and thank him for giving us time from his very busy schedule to share his thoughts on the planetary age in human history. He has interest in all areas of modern and contemporary South Asian history. His work in the area of subaltern studies is well known. In recent years, he has shown special concern for climate change and global warming. His work on the impact of humans on the planet, the Anthropocene, the age of humans is very intriguing. This evening, we are looking forward to an enlightening and stimulating address by Professor Deepesh Chakraborty on the fascinating subject of the planetary age in human history. i welcome you all once again thank you thank you ma'am for your welcome address uh, and i can see our former uh, principal and rector of the college uh, dr john abraham welcome you sir uh, i would now request our vice principal uh, dr shukrutin das to introduce our speaker uh good evening today's speaker professor dipesh chakraborty to my mind needs not much introduction and i feel extremely honored to say a few words about one of the finest historians of our time 
Dipesh Chakraborty is currently the Lawrence A. Kimpton Distinguished Service Professor in History, South Asian Languages and Civilizations at the University of Chicago, USA. He is a founding member of the Editorial Collective of Subaltern Studies, a consulting editor of Critical Inquiry, and a founding editor of Postcolonial Studies. At the beginning, I would like to refer to his long academic journey through several institutions. His physics honors days in Presidency College, Calcutta. His business school training at the Indian Institute of Management, Calcutta. His experience of being introduced into the discipline of history under the guidance of his teacher, my teacher also, historian Borunde in Calcutta. And his doctoral years of researching labor history in colonial Bengal under the supervision of Professor D. A. Lowe in Canberra, Australia. As he reminisces, he became a part of the Subaltern Studies Collective and came under the influence of Ranojit Guho during this last phase of his student life. And to go back to his statement, his intellectual and academic self has at least two kinds of sources. One is his deeply Bengali background and upbringing. Truly, he has written and published a lot in Bengali. On a personal note, Ami Dipesdar Bangla Lekha Likhit, Uttanto Gunomugdho Patho Kemo Niyomito Patho. Unar Bangla Lekha Praj Shab Lekhai Porechi. The other source happens to be his experience of Western academic institutions. In his words, there is also the question of what I owe to the West. In the long journey from his early publication, Provincializing Europe, which produced a merger of subaltern studies and post-colonial theory through his seminal work, The Calling of History, to the recent book, The Climate of History in a Planetary Age, he has been driven by the question, what history is, or what it was yesterday, and what it may be tomorrow. We find an amazingly expansive range in his writings, from a genealogy of the discipline of history in late colonial India, to the way of thinking about the dilemmas in which humans find themselves today in the wake of climate change, the pandemic, and other related problems. Of late, Professor Dipesh Chakraborty has brought the gaze of physical sciences within his historical thought, namely geology or art system science and evolutionary biology. From Ranojit Guho, the founder of Subaltern Studies Collective, which was born in 1982 with a quest for the small voice of history, Dipesh Chakraborty learned to work hard not only in the archives, but also at developing ideas. Interestingly, we find his understanding of European modernity, decolorization, politics of knowledge, and the alternative ideas of Indian thinkers like Gandhi and Rabindranath Tagore in his collection of essays, The Crisis of Civilization, Exploring Global and Planetary Histories. Truly, Dipesh Chakraborty has made important contributions to the intersections between history and post-colonial theory. His lecture today is captioned, The Planetary Age in Human History. I most eagerly look forward to hearing on an apparently intriguing subject. So now over to Professor Dipesh Chakraborty, speaker today, Dipesh Da, please. Thank you. Um, am I? Audible. Okay, good. Uh, so thank you, Shupratim, for that very warm introduction. Uh, Principal Dr. Orpita Mukherjee, Vice Principal Dr. Shupratim Dash, Dr. Shamrat Bhattacharya, distinguished guests and students. I'm deeply honored and pleased to have been invited to give this lecture comments commemorating the association of this college with its founder, the Reverend Dr. Alexander Duff. The origins of this college go back to the early days of the British Empire in India. We associate many stalwarts of the Bengal Renaissance with this institution, 
And my personal pleasure is actually enhanced by the fact that my father was a student of this college. Uh, and he took his honors degree in physics sometime soon after the college changed its name from Scottish Churches College to Scottish Church College. The topic I'm going to talk about is uh, what is being described in some circles as a new planetary age uh, in human history, suggesting thereby that it may not be enough to talk of, of the times we're living through as just global, which they still are, uh, but humans are probably having to deal with another sense of time that one may call planetary. The rest of my lecture will elaborate on this proposition. I'll, I'll try to speak for about 40, 45 minutes, not longer, I hope, and would be happy to take questions. If the philosopher Hegel were alive today to plumb the depths of our sense of the present, he would notice something imperceptibly, but inexorably seeping into the everyday historical consciousness of those who consume their daily diet of news, and that is an awareness of the planet and of its geobiological history. This is not happening everywhere at the same time uh, or at the same pace, for the global world remains undeniably uneven. The current pandemic, the rise of authoritarian and xenophobic regimes and sentiments across the globe, discussions of renewable energy, fossil fuel, climate change, extreme weather events, global warming, loss of biodiversity, the Anthropocene and so on, all signal to us, however vaguely, that something is amiss with our planet and that this may have to do with human actions. Geological events and events constituting the history of life until now have been the preserve of experts and specialists. But now the planet, however dimly sensed, is emerging as a matter of deep concern alongside our more familiar apprehensions about capitalism, injustice and inequality. The COVID-19 pandemic is the most recent and tragic illustration of how the expanding and accelerating process of globalization can trigger changes in the much longer term history of life on the planet. I will therefore speak about this emergent object category of human concern, the planet, and how it affects our familiar stories of globalization. The shift has happened in my lifetime and I hope I'll be forgiven if I begin with a few autobiographical remarks. Coming of age in the inegalitarian, turbulent, and then left-leaning city of Calcutta in the 1960s, I grew up, like many other Indians of my generation, to value and desire an egalitarian and just social order. The enthusiasms of my adolescence later found an academic expression in my early work on labor history and in my association with the Indian series Subaltern Studies, a series that aimed to acknowledge the agency of socially subordinate people in the making of their own histories. Our thoughts were also profoundly influenced by the global rise of post-colonial gender, cultural, minority, indigenous and other studies that uh, were often clubbed together in the early 1990s under the rubric, the new humanities. And the new humanity celebrated not only globalization, but also a rising vision of a democratic world in which all those who had not been heard before, women, Dalits, subaltern classes, the indigenous and the marginalized, were now heard and represented. The underlying desire was to, was to realize an inclusive growth and prosperity for humans. Some of you, the older amongst you will remember how Economic growth was celebrated as an idea in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, as a child, I grew up hearing about the MIT economists, W. W. Rostow's theories of economic takeoff that countries like India were meant to aspire to. Even though India went through an agriculture and food crisis in the early 1960s, which, is, which kind of catapulted in West Bengal the CPIM to power, we celebrated the Green Revolution of the late 1960s uh, which was technology-based. We found more of our own oil in the early 1970s in the, in the, around Bombay. And while true, it, there was an environmental and feminist movement gathering force in the 60s and particularly in the 70s, there was still this abiding sense that the world was there to serve human interests and welfare. 
technological domination of nature was even experienced as masculinity far beyond the boundaries of the so-called West. Even in our own economically depressed history of colonial Bengal and of the Bengali Hindu middle classes, a talented young and later well-known poet, Premendra Mitra, intoxicated by the seemingly triumphant success of the labor of Western humanity and taking, to, taking it to represent the pinnacle of history of human labor as a whole, thus exalted in human ravaging of the earth by portraying in a poem that he published in the late 1920s, in an entirely masculine manner, the earth itself has wanting to be so ravaged. And this is from some lines from Premendra Mitra's poem in my own inept translation. The earth begs for the thrust of the plow, the ocean for the ship's helm. Metals imprisoned in the palace of the deep pine away for the touch of man. The boisterous river wants to fall into chains, into bondage to the bridge. No time, alas, to gaze lazily on the beauty of the world. Globalization was the culmination of this process of world making, of which Alexander Duff was a part, a process that became, began, uh, began with European empires in the 15th century, but reached its pinnacle uh, as the process of decolonization ended in the 1960s. Many of the Anglo-American countries changed their former and racist immigration rules to allow for skilled migration from the, from the co formerly colonized regions of the world. I mean, you have to remember that labor migration was much older uh, from indentured labor and slavery and all kinds of um, old colonial practices. Air travel, in fact, acquired a mass character and became cheaper for it so that everybody could fly from the late 1960s on when, the jet, en when jet engines were used for civil aviation. China liberalized her economy, the four modernizations program in the late 1970s, India in 1991. My colleagues in subaltern studies and I remained preoccupied in these years with questions that marked popular struggles of our youth, questions of rights, of modernity, and of transition to a world more rational and democratic than the ones we had known. Some of my books that Shupratim mentioned, my book on rethinking working class history, provincializing Europe and habitations of modernity were products of these years. Something happened in the early part of this century that forced a shift in my own perspective. In 2003, a devastating bushfire in the Australian capital territory, Canberra, uh, took some human lives as well as the lives of many non-human beings, gutted hundreds of houses, and destroyed all the forests and parks that surround the famous bush capital of the country, the city of Canberra. These were places I had grown to love while pursuing my doctoral studies there. The sense of bereavement occasioned by these tragic losses made me curious about the history of these particular fires. And soon as I read up on their causes, brought the news of anthropogenic climate change into the human centric thought world I used to inhabit. Scientists I discovered were claiming that humans in their billions and through their technology had become a geophysical force capable of changing with fearsome consequences the climate system of the entire planet. I also learned about the, about the burgeoning scientific literature on the Anthropocene hypothesis, the proposition that human impact on the planet was such as to require a change in the geological chronology of Earth history to recognize that the planet had crossed the threshold of the Holocene epoch, about 12,000 years old. This is the epoch we're meant to be in, and had entered an epoch deserving of a new name, the Anthropocene, uh, to signify the impact that humans are having on the planet. So interestingly then, scientists were saying that humans have become a geophysical force, that we had, we had fended off the next ice age by anything between 50,000 years and 500,000 years. That our impact of the on the planet was of the same kind as the impact of the asteroid that wiped off the asteroid strike that wiped off the dinosaurs. And it was the first time that a biological species, the Homo sapiens, the Homo sapiens a species was having this kind of impact on the planet in the whole history of the Earth. 
So the figure of the human, I realized, had doubled over the course of my lifetime. There is, there was, and still is the human of subaltern studies, the human capable of struggling for equality and fairness among other humans, by caring for the environment and certain forms of non-human life. And then there was this other human, the human as a geological agent, whose history could not be recounted from purely humanocentric views, as most narratives of capital and global globalization are. The use of the word agency in the expression geological agency, that scientists were saying human beings have become a geological agent, that word agent was very different from the concept of agency that my historian heroes of the 1960s, E.P. Thompson, or our teacher, Ranajit Guha, had authored and celebrated. This agency, geological agency, was not autonomous and conscious, as it was in Thompson's or Guha's social histories, but that of an impersonal and unconscious ge geophysical force, the consequence of collective human activity. Now, whether or not geologists agree to formalize the label Anthropocene one day, I mean, they may, they may not agree to, the data amassed and analyzed over the last several years by a group in London, well, it's a global group, but it's kind of based in London. It's called the Working Group of the Anthropocene and it's set up by the International Commission of Stratigraphy in London. And that's the body that actually decides on how to read the, the rock strata on the surface of the earth in order to decide what geological uh, time we're going through. But this group was, this group was making one thing clear that we are not just in a global age. We live on the cusp of the global and what we call the planetary. In thinking of the last few centuries of human pasts and of human futures going forward, we need to orient ourselves to both what we've come to call the globe and this new entity that we're calling the planet. It's, it's not new for geologists or for biologists. It's new as, as a matter of common concern. It's, it's appearing in newspapers. Uh, it's this common category that, that is new. And this planet is not the same as the globe or the earth or the world, the categories we have so far used to organize modern global history. The intensification of capitalist globalization and the consequent crisis of global warming, along with all the debates that have attended the studies of this phenomena have ensured that the planet, or more properly, what the scientists call it the earth system, that is this they think of the planet as a, as, a, as a body in which geology and biology come together in, to work in a systemic manner. So the, these studies have ensured that the planet has swum into our cane, even across the intellectual horizons of scholars in the humanities. This, in fact, does not mean, as I've been saying, an end to the project of capitalist globalization, but the arrival of a point in history where the very Accentuation of the global discloses to humans the domain of the planetary. So, so, so you have to understand that globalization and global warming are two expressions in, in that make the use of the word global, but the word global means two different things in these two expressions. So the word global of globalization is a globe that humans have created through technology, through travel, through telephones, through now through even the kind of technology through which we are communicating. This is globalization. This is global. It's human constructed. The globe of global warming is how is really refers to how the planet functions. And they're connected, they're connected because, because to some degree, the history of globalization is also connected to the to the uh, old imperial history of European empires and eventually the Cold War. The Cold War produced atmospheric science in a big way and a competition in space. The reason why atmosphere became of interest to countries like America and the USSR as it existed then was because these countries after the Second World War were in, and having acquired atomic and uh, nuclear bombs were interested in measuring nuclear fallout, were interested to weaponize weather, whether weather, weather could be made into a military weapon in order to cause floods or droughts in your enemy's territory. And they were also thinking of colonizing Mars and other heavenly bodies to use them both for mining, exploration, for expanding our economy, 
but also for military purposes if need be so the technologies of technologies that give rise to the science of climate change and the technologies that came out of the competition of cold war are very similar so you can see the the, the connection in the way that scientists dug up old air trapped in ice old ice of 800000 years ago in order to actually be able to say that we are heating up the planet the planet was not always at this this uh, at at uh, at the point where it is now in terms of the share of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere but this technology of digging up that air that is that old would not have been available if the us defense establishment and the much denounced oil and mining companies had not developed the necessary technology for drilling that was then modified to deal with ice the globe and the planet therefore are connected what connects them uh, among what connects them is the one of the most important factor is uh, technology as part of capitalism and so so if you look at uh, the 20th century what you what you see is that the 20th century sees a huge acceleration in human history uh, some people call it the period of global great acceleration and they date it from the 1950s uh, the key to the expansion of human uh, presence on the planet was really the availability of electricity and that electricity was available in cheap and plentiful amounts thanks to fossil fuels initially coal uh, which marked the 19th century expansion is still very important and then later oil and gas all fossil fuel the 20th century therefore became a time of extraordinary change the human population it took us homo sapiens it took us until the year 1900 to reach the figure of 1.5 billion so it took us 300000 years you could say and then in 100 years at the end of the 20th century we were 6 billion in another 20 years we are close to 8 billion and the assumption is that we will stabilize at 10 billion people by the year 2050 in the 20th century the world economy increased 15 times energy use increased from 13 to 14 fold fresh water use increased 9 fold and irrigated areas by 5 fold around 200 around 2000 the majority of the consuming classes middle class people who buy refrigerators cars the majority of consuming classes were in to be found in europe in north america in the developed countries now the majority of the consuming classes are in china and and india and africa and other places the old developed countries constitute about um one third of the consuming classes and you can see how the, the how fast this class is growing so human beings uh um, uh um, this mid size of the middle class consuming class was about 1 billion in 1985 it took 21 years to get to 2 billion and then the third billion took 9 years the fourth seven years so you can see how the time is shortening for humans to become prosperous and 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 and, uh, and consume more yet the history of capitalism alone as i was saying is not enough to make sense of the situation today because there is also the dawning realization that many of today's natural disasters are consequences of changes in human socio economic institutions and technologies and there are consequences of what our prosperity the kind of impact that our prosperity has on planetary processes these planetary processes like the carbon cycle the hydrological cycle the nitrogen cycle um the way the ocean water circulates have have until or the glaciers have until now operated mostly independently of human activities but they've been central to the flourishing of human and other forms of life the more we acknowledge our emerging planetary agency the clearer it becomes that we now have to think about aspects of the planet 
that humans normally just take for granted as they go about the business of their everyday life. So that, just to give you one example, take the case of the atmosphere and the share of oxygen in it. The atmosphere is as fundamental to our existence as the simple act of breathing is. But what is the history of this atmosphere? Do we need to think about that history today in thinking about human futures? And it seems like we have to. For the last 375 million years, since the evolution of large forests, the concentration of oxygen has been maintained by certain processes on the planet at a level that ensured that animals did not suffocate from lack of oxygen and forests did not burn up from an overabundance of it. Dynamic and diverse processes maintain the atmosphere in its current equilibrium. Oxygen is a reactive gas, so the air needs a constant supply of fresh oxygen. Some of this oxygen comes from tiny sea creatures like plankton. If human activities affecting the sea and, and raising the temperature completely destroyed the plankton, which might happen if the sea level, uh, if the temperature rose by say, let's say six degrees Celsius, we would thereby destroy a major source of oxygen. In short, humans have acquired the capacity to interfere with planetary processes but not necessarily, at least not yet, the capacity to fix them. Now, because our ability to shape the planet are largely technological, technology becomes a very important and intrinsic part of this unfolding story about humans. There was a time when technology was feared by philosophers. A line of famous German thinkers from Oswald Spengler, Heidegger, Jaspers, Gadamer, Arendt, Schmidt, among others, watched with foreboding the fast advance of global technology and feared the final uprooting of humans, the, the collapse of an ever present human project of dwelling by worlding the earth. They used to fear that technology will make the world so uniform and so quickly that we'll all become rootless. Hans Jonas actually pointed out something very interesting in his book on another German philosopher on called responsibility where he pointed out the real, that the, one of the real problems with fast and te technological speeds of change is that when humans develop technology very fast and change the world around them, animals and other forms of life, which only change on an evolutionary scale, do not get enough time to adjust to the human changes and they go extinct. So think of the lion and the deer. <clears throat> the more the lion became through evolution, an expert hunter, <clears throat> the more the deer acquired the capacity to run faster because the two changes were kind of keeping pace with each other. But now we have created deep sea fishing trawlers, which do not give the fish the right amount of evolutionary time to adjust because evolutionary time works over millions of years. Whereas technology changes things in decades. And therefore, the, so if, if our development of fishing trawlers happened over one million years, the fish would have learned by then how to avoid the fishing trawlers and would have survived the impact. But now they don't have the time, so they go extinct. So one of the deep problems we are facing is that, that we have developed technology, we have expanded our presence because of technology um, and technology has been beneficial to us in that sense. But technological change happens so fast that other creatures that depend on evolutionary change to adjust to each other's changes cannot adjust to our changes. And that's one reason why species die and why we are actually destroying the life support system that supports even our life. Yet what has happened is that we, we, are, we have become deeply dependent on technology for survival. A geologist at Duke University, Peter Half, recently put forward uh, this idea of the technosphere. So he argued that just as uh, the planet, the earth, has a rocky uh, mantle we call lithosphere, then there's the zone of life, which is now called critical zone, but used to be called biosphere. Then we have the atmosphere, then going up we have the stratosphere, we said, he said, Peter Haff said, we should also think about the planet as containing a film of technology surrounding it, which he, was, which he called technosphere. And so technosphere for him is all the 
technology that connects us together. Uh, from the kind of connectivity through which we are uh, communicating to shipping containers that move medicines around, food around, all of these things, or technology that goes into modern agriculture. And his argument is this, that without this technosphere, we would not be able to support 7 billion to let's say 10 billion human beings on the planet. And he says that if you took out this technological connection that connects us, the total human population on the planet, he says, would quickly decline, I'm quoting him, would quickly decline towards its stone age base of no more than 10 million individuals. And technology therefore one can say has become a condition for biology, for the existence of technology in such massive numbers, of, for the existence of humans or in such massive numbers on the planet and not just humans. I mean, thanks to a kind of the way you have technologized the production of food, the most populous bird on the planet, which number 23 billion, is broiler chicken. That we, you know, and, and every chicken produced in the broiler chicken process has a maximum, has an average life of six weeks before we consume it. The next most populous bird, I forget the name, but that is naturally populous, is just 1.5 billion. So we've actually produced even more of other life forms that we, for our own consumption, and more than the larger this middle class becomes, and one thing that happens as people come into money, and this is why we are having the current pandemic, they eat more protein. And they, if they have more money, they eat exotic food, like whatever the gentleman in China in Wuhan ate, uh, whereby a virus um, came into human bodies. But this is why we will need to produce more meat, more uh, chicken to produce the planet that this middle class people will want to consume. So Huff therefore says that our technology has become the condition for our biology. But this dependent on technology means that we have already made the earth into some kind of a spaceship. The reason why if the example of the ship is, uh, is this, you see, <clears throat> it was Europeans who made the first um, uh, deep sea going vessels and without which they wouldn't have been able to create empires. And once they created, before that, the sea was mostly coastal for most people and most trading was coastal. But once they created the deep sea going ve vessels, the, the Human beings had, the, for the first time, had an experience which now, we now have every time we get on an airplane, is that your life depends on that piece of technology working. So on the ship, as on airplanes today, life was critically dependent on the proper functioning of technology. If the technology failed, life failed. And Huff's argument is that technosphere has become the primary condition for the survival of seven or say 10 billion humans, if that has happened, we could say that we have already made Earth into something like a spaceship, like something like a ship, in that its capacity to support our many billion lives is now dependent on the existence of the technosphere itself. We have become, he says, the sentient aspects of technology. It's not only that, I mean, we have also become uh, the most uh, serious and prodigious Earth moving agents on, on, the, on, on, the, on the planet, and not just on the planet, we've even um, trawled the sea bottom across an area of some 15 million kilometers, square kilometers each year we do, by the end of the 20th century, we were doing this. So most of the world's continental shelves, significant areas of the upper continental slope, and along with upper surface of sea mounts have been refashioned by humans. So this biological and geomorphological role of humans cannot be separated from the history that connects capitalism with global warming. So we are now the biggest, we move more earth around than all the natural processes combined in the world. So, you know, these yellow earth moving machines that you see around you are, uh, are quite symptomatic of what we've become. The publication by Worldwide Fund of Nature, The Loss of Nature and the Rise of Pandemics, which, was, uh, which came out recently, made very similar propositions. They were saying that human activities are causing cataclysmic changes to our planet. 
the growing human population and rapid increases in consumption have led to profound changes in land cover, river and ocean, rivers and oceans, the climate system, biological, biochemical, biogeochemical cycles, and the way ecosystem functions, with major implications for our own health and well-being. Uh, <clears throat> their, their Living Planet report for 2018 charts a 60% average decline in the abundance of vertebrate population across the globe in just over 40 years. Land use change, including deforestation and the modification of natural habitats are, are responsible for nearly half of the emerging zoonosis, that is zoonotic diseases, diseases that come to humans from wild animals. So they're saying actually land use change that includes deforestation uh, is responsible for nearly half of the emerging zoonotic diseases. And you have to remember that <clears throat> almost 75% of the new infectious diseases of the last 20, 20 years have been zoonotic diseases. In other words, 75% of diseases have come from viruses or bacteria changing hosts, moving from wild animals to humans. <clears throat> Deforestation will change patterns of rainfall and evaporation. And if it goes on, a savanna landscape will emerge, which will be a source of atmospheric carbon rather than of carbon sink. Now, people don't know how much, how much of the forest we can afford to lose before this happens. This is, sometimes they say maybe it's as little as 25%. At the moment, we are now at 17%. The current moment of the COVID-19 pandemic belongs not only to the global history of capitalism, and its destructive impact on human life. It also represents a moment in the history of biological life on this planet when humans are acting as the amplifiers of a virus whose host reservoir may have been some bats in China for millions of years, they say 50 million. Well, bats are an old species. They've been around for about 50 million years. Viruses for much, much, much longer. In the Darwinian history of life, all forms of life seek to increase their chances of survival. This new virus, the novel coronavirus, thanks to the demand for exotic meat in China, jumped species and has now find, found a wonderful agent in humans that allows it to spread worldwide. Why? Because humans, very social animals, now exist in very large numbers, in very big urban concentrations, on a planet that is crowded with them. And most of them are extremely mobile in pursuit of their life opportunities. Our history in recent decades has been that of the Great Acceleration, and the expand, an expansion of global economy in the emancipatory hope that this will pull hundreds of millions of humans out of poverty. Or at least that has been justification behind the rapid economic growth in many nations of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. From the point of view of the virus, however, the environmental disturbance that this has caused and the fact of human global mobility have been welcome developments. Humans, we win their battle against the virus. And as a human being, I really hope we do but the virus has already won the war. This is no doubt an episode. This pandemic is an episode in the Darwinian history of life. And the changes it causes will be momentous, both in our global history and in the planetary history of biological life. If all this and much else about human impact on the planet suggest to Earth system scientists that the planet may have passed the threshold of the Holocene and entered a new geological epoch altogether, we can then say that as humans, we presently live in two different kinds of times. Simultaneously, our own awareness of ourselves, the now of human history has become entangled with the long now of geological and biological timescales, something that has never happened before in the history of humanity. And uh, <clears throat> this actually poses, uh, on the one hand, it creates the problems, the shrinking habit habitability of the earth, rise in the number of climate refugees, illegal immigrants, water scarcity, the kind of problems that newspapers talk about. Uh, but what it causes also are interesting clash of times that we experience. And I will, uh, I'm coming to the end of my lecture. So I'll just give you one example of how the kind of contradiction in contradictions we are caught in between what we understand intellectually about where human history is at and the priorities of our lives, which are not very easy to change. 
And the simple and the example I give is the is what's happening in the market for air conditioning in India. You know that most Indian cities, like cities globally, are becoming heat islands. There are so many people, so many tall buildings that air flow is affected. So that the overall the cities are becoming hotter and hotter. And therefore, more and people, more and more people are buying air conditioners in India. On October 12, in 2016, negotiators from 170 nations met in Kigali, Rwanda, and agreed to phase out the use of heat-trapping hydrofluorocarbons used in making the cheapest air conditioner that aspirational families, often low in social hierarchy, have begun to buy in countries like India. So these old air conditioners are really uh, very bad for the atmosphere. But the air conditioners enable them to deal with summers that get hotter with every passing year. But at the same time, these hydrofluorocarbons trap heat 1,000 times more effectively than does carbon dioxide. So one of my colleagues, uh, Michael Greenstone, and some people from uh, New York Times have actually done some research on this question in, um, in Delhi. Now, annually, Delhi currently gets five or six days when the average temperature goes above 95 degrees Fahrenheit. By the end of the century, it is said the number of such days is expected to rise to 75. So Delhi will get 75 days that will be unbearably hot. The mortality effects of each additional day over 95 degrees Fahrenheit are 25 times greater in India than in the United States where the use of air conditioners reduced by 80% the number of heat-related deaths between 1960 and 2004 in, in America. Uh, so air conditioners actually do save lives. But at the same time, they say that a surge in the use of HFC fueled air conditioners would alone contribute to a nearly full degree Fahrenheit rise of atmospheric warming over the last coming century in an environment where just three degrees of warming could be enough to tip the planet into an irreversible future of rising sea levels, more powerful storms and deluges, extreme drought, food shortages. Yet this surge is exactly what is happening in India. And you might ask why, I mean, there are better technologically, more sophisticated air conditioners that are not as damaging. You might ask why, are, why isn't India going for those air conditioners? A, they're much more expensive. They need skilled labor force to install, whereas the current air conditioners can be assembled even in a garage, you know, mechanics shop, and they can come in, install it. Uh, and that's why one reason, and maybe the air conditioner manufacturers in India also lobbied at this Kigali conference, India lobbied hard and successfully to belong to the third category of countries that would be the slowest to change. So the situation in India now is that the purchase of air condition uh, is actually driving growth in the air conditioner market. And it's the purchase of the first unit ever. So people who have never, never used air conditioners are now buying air conditioners, including urban working class families in Delhi. And it's, and it's fascinating. And it's really in subaltern studies terms, their research uh, captures some of the, what Ranajit Gohi used to call the small voices of history. So they've interviewed people uh, in Delhi to ask about what, what, what is happening with the air conditioner, why is it buying them? And invariably, the air conditioner brings news of joy to these families. So somebody says, it's for the first time in our life that we slept well. And I have a sense of well-being in my body because these are sometimes slummy conditions. We have six, six, seven people to a room and they don't sleep well in that terrible heat. And the air conditioner is allowing them to sleep for the first time. Or somebody says, it's the first time that my son could stay up all night and prepare for his exams, or one person says medical college entrance exams, without getting uh, eaten up by mosquitoes. So the air conditioners are actually bringing real benefit to these people in their lives. And they fit in with their priorities, because everybody wants their children to get to good school, get to get good education, get on with life. But at the same time, and 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 India, in response to uh, uh, this situation, wanted to be the slowest to change. Uh, mind you, compared to uh, America and India, the number of 
the percentage of urban residents with air conditioning is residential houses at about five, six percent. In China, that was the percentage share in 1990s. It's now almost in 10 years, the figure rose to 100 percent. But as my colleague Greenstone, who is doing the some of this research, says, the very technology that can help people to help to protect people from climate change also accelerates the rate of climate change. In other words, what these families are doing, they're basically engaging in a trade-off between their immediate priorities of getting their children to educate themselves and the situation of the city. The city is actually becoming hotter. So their children may not be able to stay in that city. They may have to move somewhere else. But that's the kind of contradictions in in our thinking about time that we get caught up in. So what we then see is, <clears throat> or to give you other examples where we see contradictions in our own lives. Um, with the construction boom, not, not only in India, but also in Bangladesh, uh, Indian suppliers of marble uh, have become uh, very important. Um, for feeding this construction boom. Because now every, every middle class family wants a decent kitchen, they want a granite top or a marble top, a kitchen bench, in, in, and, uh, and that's legitimate purely from their point of view. But the result at the other end is, is what you realize when you read reports saying that 31 hills in the Aravalli range have gone missing. What does it mean for hills to go missing? It means that they have their, they exist on topographic maps, but they don't exist physically because they've been raised to the ground through illegal quarrying of marble. So you can see how, or think of the crisis with sand supply in India. All these, all the buildings we build require sand, and all the stories you read about what's called in Bangla Bali Khadan. Uh, the illegal dredging of rivers to supply the sand that middle class consumption needs. Sometimes the, the report comes to you as poignant report about a tragic event. I remember reading something where uh, a bunch of young men had gone in Bengal, in West Bengal, to uh, bathe in a river with a lot of sandbanks in it. Could, could have been no joy, uh, with a lot of sandbanks in it. And the river was known to be shallow. But what they did not know was that the river had been dredged to get sand out of its bottom. So the river had become much deeper and the currents had changed. And one of the young men who didn't, who couldn't swim well, actually drowned to death. So the crisis of the environment turned up in Anandabajar Pudrika or somewhere as a little piece of news on a personal tragedy. But, but, but these personal tragedies or personal joys of having a kitchen with, uh, with a granite tabletop or a, a white marble top may actually be connected to the hills going missing in Rajasthan. In fact, uh, when I was once, I was going around India and I realized that if you speak to the, mas the masters and the leaders of the IT in industry in India, you actually get, um, you actually get to meet, meet very decent people. Uh, but the raw materials industry, obviously also has some very decent people, which is in the proper uh, legal sector, but it also has a huge illegal sector. Uh, sometimes politicians get involved. When the Beijing Olympics happened, the number of illegal mines exporting iron ore and iron to, to China in India, number of illegal mines in India went up hugely. And the figure was in terms of tens of thousands. So why does that happen and why are we in this situation? Why do we actually have to kind of negotiate this gap between what we cognitively understand about the world and what we think our options are? And it's partly because the kind of technological uh, societies we've developed, the kind of structures we've developed, these actually make us a lot less flexible as a civilization than, um, let's say, a human civilization based on foraging or hunting and gathering would be. 
people dependent on hunting and gathering could easily move from one place to another, take all their infrastructure, very minimal, hold us, pull us out and move somewhere or build a new. Whereas once you live in big cities, you are technology dependent. And even when you create these problems, uh, it's very hard to move around. So once you got, once you have to employ 8 billion people, 10 billion people, you need industries. Yeah. You, in order to feed these people, you need farmland, you need habitation, and all these things encroach on forests. The more we encroach on forests, and this is what all infectious disease specialists are saying, that the very root of this pandemic and very root of pandemics are crisis of nature. So more you cut forests down, the more you force wild animals to come closer to us. They don't normally come, want to come close to us, but you push them. And therefore, the more you will have pandemics and some of these infectious diseases specialists are now saying that we are in an era of pandemics. In other words, even when COVID-19 uh, becomes, let's say, manageable, becomes an endemic disease because of vaccinations working, we might have to face, we might have to go through another pandemic. So, so there's this cash 22 situation where once you have a technology dependent civilization, you become dependent on technology even for solutions to the problems you face. So just to give you an example, people who uh, think uh, about the situation from an evolutionary point of view, for, from the point of view of uh, the history of life on the planet, like a very famous biologist called Edward Wilson at Harvard, retired now, but very, very well known. He has a book called Half Earth, and he clearly argues that human beings should leave half of the surface of the planet for non-human life. Now, that might sound uh, too, too theatrical, but well, he has a concrete proposition. He says, look, there are 144,000 natural parks in the world. And he said, can we restore them to their original uh, biodiversity conditions? Because in many of these national, natural parks, the capstone species, uh, it could be a tree, uh, has been taken out by humans. Humans have actually interfered. The, the so-called uh, national parks are not in the pristine condition in which humans found them. And he is saying, can we, can we take them back to the pristine condition? In fact, one area of the world where humans don't interfere at all and has become a thriving place for biological diversity is the demilitarized zone between the two Koreas. So his argument is that let's let's create more of more such zones. But that is hard for us to do because there's the question of employment. There's the question of um, immediate people in front of you and their aspirations. So therefore, we fall back on technology and, and on technological utopia. So I'll just end by talking about how deep the dilemma is and by talking about certain technological utopia. So you know that in 2015, nations got together to have make a deal on climate change. It's called the Paris deal, 2015 deal. If you read that deal carefully, you will see that the entire agreement between nations as to what they would do in an unsupervised manner, completely on their own, to cut down on carbon emissions, all that agreement depends on one assumption. And the assumption is that by 2070, or so, we will have a technology to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and sequester it safely somewhere under, under the ground or wherever. We don't have the technology to do it. But that has become the assumption on which we can make a deal. Similarly, while Wilson says, let's withdraw, let's scale back, the Gates Foundation has actually funded Wilson's colleague in the Harvard Physics Department, David Keith, to actually ex experiment to see how it might be possible for human beings to spread aerosol particles in the stratosphere to reflect a lot of the sunlight back so that we get, let's say, 100 years of um, temperature control, by which time we might be moving uh, to other kinds of solutions, at least to get relief. And one outcome that people have pointed out is if you actually 
scatter sunlight back, the sky will be permanently, permanently white. You will not see the blue sky anymore. The other telling story is like, which I haven't touched actually, insects have been dying in very large numbers. The most critical prospect we face is bees dying because insects and particularly bees are ap absolutely critical to the fruit industry. If bees died, who would pollinate the plants? And now there are experiments in America to develop robotic bees, bees that hum which will be mine tiny, tiny minuscule robots, which will fly from flower to flower and pollinate, help pollinate. So it, ra it raises this dilemma of the planetary age. Some people say, do you want to live in a world where the insects are basically robots? And can we actually manage the planet? Can we really go on banking on technological utopias in order to carry on with the civilization? Or do we need to find ways of scaling it, scaling back? That's the dilemma. And it's a real dilemma, as I was trying to explain with the use of the air conditioner example. It's not an easy problem to solve. But one thing I know is that we are a species that learns. But we learn through the crisis we face and learn by paying the price of experience. So sitting in Calcutta, one of the prospects you face is a higher frequency of cyclones like Amphan hitting the Bengal coast because the Bay of Bengal is actually, the seas are warming up at a higher rate than the Arabian seas. And if there's more, if the temperature is higher, it, there's more moisture coming into the air, which affects the, the, both the speed and the frequency of the cyclones. So as these things happen, uh, as we face more of the climate crisis one by one, we will learn, but by paying perhaps, and unfortunately, the price of experience. So thank you very much for your patience. I'll end there and uh, take questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you uh, to Professor Deepesh Chakraborty for uh, a rather uh, hard heating uh, and um, powerful uh, uh, deliverance on, I guess, concerns which have become uh, very close to our home right now, that is change in our climate. But uh, I guess, sir, your lecture also um, uh, provided uh, a very um, illuminating understanding of how uh, our understanding of the climate change also uh, may lead to changes in uh, our long standing understandings of history of uh, man as uh, agency. Uh, and so on. Thank you, sir, again for agreeing to be with us and uh, for uh, uh, really uh, providing us with certain pointers, which were nonetheless rather alarming. But I guess uh, uh, such alarms are necessary for us to become more conscious and to be more careful in, in the way forward, I guess, in our future. Um, we'll be taking questions. Um, Sir, would you prefer to take one question at a time? I think that would be. Uh, I mean, can I can I see the questions? Are they all coming up in the chat? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, okay. sir. You can see them in the chat box. Okay. Actually, we would help if somebody would somebody would um, route them to me because it takes time to read through them. So if no, you no, read, I'll, I'll do that. Read. I'll do that for you, and I'll, I'll do that one I mean, at a time. Once you, yeah, once you. Yeah, once you picked one, then I can, if I don't yes, understand the question, I can Yes, sir. Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. So uh, I'll start off then. Uh, yeah. And uh, the first question actually came from uh, George Thadathil. I hope I got your name right, sir. And uh, uh, he asked a two-part question. Uh, the first part being, uh, what happens to the valuation of the human and human enterprise on the planet when seen through the planetary and galactic history? That is his first question. And the second one is, does it in some way pave the way for the surveillance capitalism and right-wing assertions taking a piggyback ride on the global capital? Well, I'm very quickly, I, I would take a galactic view, but, but it's clear that uh, when you, even when you look at the long history of the planet, as I was saying, the assumption that we had 
and increasingly people shared in it that, that somehow human beings are special and this planet is meant for us. That assumption gets challenged when even when you think of the slight as some, something as singularly important to us as the, as the air we breathe, that the air we breathe has been there for about almost close to 400 million years. So it was not created with us in mind. We use it and, uh, and we are not special in that sense, though unfortunately for a long time, some religions and some humanism, humanist thinkers have always kind of preached our specialty. So one thing you realize that if you, if you take a global view, then we are central to the story of globalization. If you take a planetary view, then you begin to write a history in which humans are decentered. So it's not centered on human beings. And subjects like geology and uh, evolutionary biology routinely do that because we, for them, we come so late in the story that we can't be central to the story. Whereas when we write humanist histories of what human beings have done, we are naturally central to the story. Uh, does it pay for surveillance capitalism, right-wing assertion? As I was saying, you know, it's how people are going to use the crisis depends on so many political things, how uh, people who are opposed to capitalism, how much political power they have, uh, how much political power do cap And within capitalism, as I said, I mean, there's a, there's a zone of illegality, particularly in a place like India, a lot of see a, a lot of our economies in the informal sector. And then uh, when it comes to things like extractive, what we call extractive capitalism, resources like forests produce, mining produce, um, there's a lot of illegality there, sometimes even organized illegality by very big companies. Uh, so it really, it's a very political question what you're asking and I can't predict how it will go, but but the planet is becoming a political question. I wouldn't deny that. Very true, sir. Um, the next question comes from Ruksha Ghosh and she asks from the context of uh, the situation that we find ourselves in, that is the pandemic. Uh, she asks, sir, if humans have affected the environment the same way as meteors, so how did lockdown, which we can say was a massive pause in our everyday life, affect our environment? Was it anyhow beneficial? If yes, can we incorporate lockdown eventually to protect our planet? Also, sir, uh, can economy, technology, and biology go hand in hand without hampering each other's existence? Yeah. So the lockdown had many lessons, and I'm sure you learned some of them in Calcutta, as I learned them in Chicago. One was that everybody from everywhere in the world reported the moment humans withdraw, the skies become clearer, the air is cleaner, uh, the rivers seem cleaner. Uh, so the lockdown, I think you suddenly see birds that you have not seen for a while. So the lockdown um, told us about our impact, the kind of impact we have. I don't know whether we can afford not to have the impact is a different question, but it definitely showed us what kind of uh, impact we have on other, other, other forms of life on, on nature itself. Um, the problem with the lockdown strategy is, I think the lockdown strategy worked very, very well in slightly richer countries where you not only locked down people, but you also gave them um, money to subsist on. Uh, so I think of New Zealand, Australia, some of the European countries where uh, Australia, for instance, introduced a wage contract whereby they paid people almost 70% of their wages for a whole year. So, you know, if a lock, the lockdown works well, if the entire nation decides to undergo some privation so that national savings are spent more on the vulnerable people. You know, but if you, if you don't give the poor any money and you simply lock them down, what will they eat and how will they eat? So you will naturally get a demand for them to work, either, you know, to let them work and, and rich people will actually pay back on that demand and say, open up the economy. So it very much depends on what kind of social contract the nation represents. And my own sense about India, unfortunately, is that it does not represent the kind of social contract that welfare states do. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'll next move on to a question which has been put forward by uh, our uh, own Professor Shonvar Bhattacharji, our IQAC coordinator. Uh, he's from the Department of Zoology. Uh, he asks, 
uh, we often talk of a concept of sustainable development. How far do you think it is practiced effectively? And if so, how far is it having its impact? So, I mean, the, I mean, the, the word sustainable is used in many different senses and sometimes sustainable development becomes the mantra of what people sometimes call green capitalism. Um, so it becomes a question of whether we can sustain capitalism and sustain profit. Sustaining capitalism means sustain profits, sustain class structures, sustain privileges um, in the, in the future, into the future, well into the future. But one thing I do want to say is that People who have been now, so if you think about the difference between the globe and the planet in my terms, then I would say that sustainability is part of the globalization talk because sustainability is a very human centric concept. The corresponding, the corresponding concept in earth system science is habitability. So habitability, you ask the question, what does, what does make, what makes the planet habitable? To complex multicellular forms of life. And that would include non-humans as well. Uh, so this is why when, you know, long time back in the 60s, when James Lovelock was working in Carl Sagan's uh, unit in NASA, and they were thinking about whether or not humans could colonize Mars and how to make Mars habitable, one of the answers that uh, Lovelock gave, which I think had a lot of point to it, looking at the history of this planet, he said, make it habitable for bacteria and they'll take care of the rest. Right. So, as you know, of the great oxygenation event. So, the role that this, as somebody said, this planet is actually run by forms of life that humans love to think of as low. But without these low forms of life, life would be very difficult to run. And we come at the end of the history of life, towards the end of the history of life on the planet. Uh, and that's why the question of keeping the planet habitable for multicellular complex forms of life and not just for humans, for me is a more important question than keeping the planet sustainable for humans. Uh, sustainable is defined, as you know, from the Brunton report, leaving it in a condition for future generations of humans that you've, you've, you've found it in. Uh, because see the, if you destroy the soil, it takes tens of thousands of years to, for the soil to come back. If, if when you lose biodiversity, like through a great extinction, it takes millions of years to come back. Uh, so the more we understand that as a form of life, we are connected to other forms of life. And if we are not connected to other forms of life, all these medical tests of vaccines on you know, rats and other, other, other non-human beings wouldn't make sense. It's precisely because there's a historical connection between our bodies and other mammalian bodies. That the virus becomes effective for us. You know, bat is a mammal. So the virus is habituated to a mammalian body and that prepares it to enter our body and work through our bodies. And, and this connection between our body and other bodies is what helps both the virus and the developers of vaccination. And the more we realize that we are connected, the more we will not speak simply of sustainability in human eccentric terms. I, I guess your, your thoughts are shared by many of our uh, audience here. Uh, many of them have posted rather alarming questions on whether the planet is coming to an end. Are we going oh. extinct? <laughs> and uh, I'll just okay. Move. Let me let me pick one. <laughs> let me let me pick one question uh, that I I think uh, Shimo, if you don't mind. No, no, sir. Uh, absolutely that, not. Uh, that was from question from Harshranjan Rajak. The melting of glaciers can unlock new diseases. What I've read about is that the, mel the melting of the permafrost in Siberia can definitely give rise to new diseases, maybe the glaciers too. I haven't read on the glaciers and diseases, but I've read on the permafrost uh, and permafrost and, uh, and uh, diseases. So if the permafrost melts, it not only gives rise to more methane, but it actually can bring new kind of viruses. And so I think the point that Anthony Fauci, who was in charge of... Uh, infectious diseases in America, who's been through Trump's period and whose head Steve Bannon was baying for. I mean, he wrote the article with his colleague, David Morris in September saying, we are in an era of pandemics and it's happening. The pandemics will be happening more frequently because of what we are doing to the planet. Uh, uh, many questions are the same line. Maybe I'll 
I can uh, give you some which are talking a bit more positively, trying to find a solution. Uh, there is a question from Ritunjoy Dotto who asks, uh, you said today we depend very much on technology. If okay. technology failed, we failed. Uh, so is our planet gradually coming to an end? And to that question, I will add one coming from Christine who asks, do you see human beings actively reversing progress and turning back the hands of time towards naturalistic growth? No. See what, see first of all, what I was saying was that if there are so many humans, so our numbers expanded because we were able to manage public health, reduce epidemics, produce more food. All of these things are dependent on technology. Uh, so if you think of food production, um, this capacity to, sorry, this capacity to pull nitrogen out of the air, see, it was in, it was the end of the 18th century that a German uh, scientist working on soil called Liebig, whom Marx discusses actually in Capital, uh, who Liebig realized that soil needs more nitrogen to become more productive. And from then on through the 19th century, we've been basically using fertilizers. The empires were using fertilizers by importing uh, basically bird droppings from Peru and Chile you know, uh, into Europe. When the First World War happened, the British stopped the supply of these fertilizers to Germany. And therefore German scientists eventually through this process called the Haberbosch process, invented a technology by which you could actually pull nitrogen out of the air and feed it artificial fertilizers, feed it to uh, crops to grow them. And that has saved the world. I mean, when we have so many people, it's, it's artificial fertilizers. And now with genetic experiments, artificial fertilizers, feeding 10 billion people may not be a problem. But the problem is that modern agriculture becomes uniform. So that even the, the biological diversity of seeds uh, is reduced because you, you favor seeds that actually uh, will, that you have engineered and that will respond to your technology. And therefore you make yourself extremely vulnerable to a natural shock uh, right? because of the loss of diversity. So, uh, and the other problems on the other hand, like if you have 10 billion people, they will want to eat. And if they have money, they'll want to eat well. A part of that will be eating more protein. <laughs> so, right? So they'll eat more fish, they'll eat more chicken cell. So that has all kinds of uh, addresses. So the, what, is, what is becoming clear is that the attitude that the world is there to just serve us, which was there also in some of the more modern religions. Like by modern religion, I mean Christianity, Judaism, you know, what's called axial religion. A colleague of mine in Chicago wrote a book on Islam, a very well-known Islam specialist, Fazul Rahman, dead now. And he has a whole chapter ask, uh, discussing why Allah is called Rahman, merciful. And his answer is very similar to a biblical answer, that basically because God has provisioned this planet for us. He's put fish in water. He's put fruit on trees so that we can live. You see... Kant discussing the Genesis story at the end of the 18th century, the biblical Genesis story. And it allows Kant to say that man can say to sheep, the fleece on your body is meant for me. So this, this attitude had grown, I mean, it goes back to the early 17th century, uh, European discussions about what to colonize and what land, should the, should the sea be everybody's? And there was this, in 17th century, if you read Locke, Grotius, you'll see that Europeans suddenly come into a sense of abundance. And this because, you know, Locke writes uh, uh, in his second volume of the treaty is that land is as abundant as water. Why? Because they've discovered the new world and they're taking up Native Americans' land. So, so from 17th century, Europeans have, Europeans built this idea that, built on the idea that we are special, things are meant for us. They use the Bible to, to that end. And as I was reading this poem from Premendra Mitra, you will see that we also imbibe some of that sense, right? And, and there was a gendered sense of it. Premendra Mitra's poem is extremely masculine. Mm -hmm. uh, that the earth is asking for 
the thrust of the plow. Haler agha or Haler aghat or lang oler haga aghat. Prithibi magi chhe something like that. Uh, in that context, maybe this question might be a bit interesting. Um, there's a question from Abhig Goha Thakutta, and he asks, is space colonization a feasible solution to the looming problem of overpopulation of the Earth? Yeah, I see the question now. Yeah, well, um, <laughs> this, is a, this is a very interesting. There's a French philosopher, Bruno Latour, who has written interestingly on, on this problem. Not in the foreseeable future. I mean, some people might go and develop a underground colony. You know, at the moment they're developing these robotic dogs for exploring caves on Mars because they think that the early settlement will be in caves in order to save us from the the uh, the radiation of the sunlight to protect ourselves. So, no, I don't think uh, the population question can be addressed through colonization in the foreseeable future. Uh, there's a question from our very own uh, Vice Principal, Dr. Shukrupin Dash. Uh, yeah. uh, he asks, uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the domestic and foreign policy agendas of all countries have been turned upside down. The pandemic has brought new problems and competition areas to states and to the international system. Uh, disorder is most likely in the post-pandemic period. Do you think a new international system will emerge? I think the pandemic will definitely leave some lasting changes. I mean, these electronic platforms will definitely improve. Um, and it will produce some, it will produce some good things. I mean, travel may become essential travel rather than non-essential travel, which is a good thing. But at the same time, the travel industry will try to reinvent other forms of travel to keep their business in, in place. Uh, will a new industrial international system emerge from this one pandemic? I don't, I, I don't think so. But something that people have been struggling to have, and which speaks partly to this question, for a long time, and this is a, this is a question that arises in other folds too, there are clearly areas where we need global agencies with more power than national governments. So for instance, suppose we assume that we're not going to change economically, forests will be uh, destroyed, there will be more pandemics. What can we do? One of the things we can do is to have an early warning system in place. And one of the, and the second thing we can do is to have information travel faster, therefore. Uh, so the kind of way in which China initially didn't want to share information about the disease, mm. that if we keep that kind of nation state system in place, then we'll be doing damage to ourselves. So there is an argument now for having an early warning detection system, an early response team, so that ideally what you can do, even if you have the nation states, there should be a global team that's ready, that's, that has the capacity and the authority to move in any where, where pandemic breaks out and contain it. Because the trick to stopping the, pan, stopping the illness from becoming pandemic is to contain it. So if it's not naturally contained, you'll have to move in very quickly and contain the people among which, which has happened and not let the virus get new hosts. But that cannot happen as easily if there are national governments in complete charge. So if this is seen as a, as a kind of uh, attack on national sovereignty, then we're in trouble. Yes, sir. I think there's a, another question from George Thadathil, but it's a very, I think, a relevant question given, I think the world were quite concerned with what happened to Amazon. Uh, this year. So he asked, what is the studied stance of the academia and environment control research on the destruction of the Amazon? There's a lot of studies actually on the destruction of the Amazon, but the kind of, but they don't have the impact to stop the burning of the Amazon and the, and the cutting down of it. So I, so I don't think if you come to the purely academic side of it, I don't think there's a studied silence. I mean, the Amazon is commented on a lot. I mean, I was reading something last night. Um, see, I would go further and say that there's a need for us to recognize regions that are of significance to more than a nation state. So the example I often give you are the Himalayan glaciers. The Himalayan glaciers, rivers coming out of the glaciers serve about eight or nine countries from Pakistan to Vietnam. But every nation state treats glaciers and rivers as their own. 
And I often think in an ideal state, there would be a regional agreement and a regional authority to protect the rivers and protect the health of the glaciers. But again, it means thinking beyond the nation state. And somehow the governments are not that, that point yet. And that I think, I think the pressure of circumstances eventually will, will have forced them to recognize the need for some supra nation state governance in particular areas. Uh, I think uh, we are just about uh, at the end of our question answer session. Uh, okay. And I would like to club two questions here, two very sure. simple but powerful questions, I guess. One very put very simply, uh, the name is not given. It comes from SCC, from Scottish Church College, I guess, to us or to you. Uh, more specifically, what should be the role of individual to save the planet? And if I may add to that, a question comes from one of our former students, Shono Lata. Uh, she asks, if we fall back on Gandhian economic philosophy, would it be helpful to save the environment and planet? Um, let me take the first question. So the, the principle is clear, is that we should all scale back. And then it's up to you to really think where to scale back. I mean, uh, for instance, how much electricity to use? What kind of cars to buy? I mean, so we have choices in every day that we make for all sorts of reasons. So, and I'll give you two, sto two, two stories about both from Calcutta. So last earlier this year, actually, some, with my, some colleagues in Calcutta and colleagues elsewhere, uh, we, had, we had a program of half a day in collaboration with the Lamartine School with students from about 22, 23 schools from Calcutta. Uh, who were in the year 9 to 12 uh, age group. And we talked about climate change. And at the end of the day, the children, or the young people, uh, put a very interesting question. They were saying, we understand, how do we, un how do we convince our grown-ups, how do we convince our parents not to buy a bigger car? And, and, uh, and that question took me back to a conversation with a Bengali friend who was a well-to-do person. And he was he was going to buy a new Mercedes car, he had a Toyota car. And I said to him, um, why are you buying a Mercedes car? It's just going to be a bigger car. Uh, isn't your Toyota car working? He said, no, it's working fine. But you see, I make more money than I used to. And if I don't buy a Mercedes car, how will other people know that I make more money than I used to? So, I mean, he said it as a joke, but, but you know, this young man who asked that question in, at La Martinier, how will I convince my, my father or my parents? Our sense of status, hierarchy, our investment in these things are based on, a, on an assumption about the world where the world is simply there to serve me. And that assumption seems is a very damaging assumption to make. So we all have to scale back and how much you can scale back where, it, you know, what you can negotiate with people you live with, whoever, they can't, it can't be prescriptive to that degree. And the only thing I'll say is that you can't ask that very poor person to scale back because he or she has been scaled back by the circumstances. So the scaling back really has to be done by the more privileged people. Going back to the question about Gandhi's, I mean, obviously Gandhi was, a, was critical of industrial civilization. But two things, you know. One is the question that economists raise often with this question of returning to smaller economies, shrinking the economy, degrowth. Uh, and my economist friend raised this question, I don't have a good answer to it. They say, you know, you won't be able to feed 10 billion human beings without modern agriculture. And I know that modern agriculture is environmentally bad, but that's the depth of the dilemma. Any call for lower human numbers without educating women and giving them more power becomes in a sense an anti-poor proposition. So there's, there's this 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 one hard question, and the next and the third second thing I want to say both about Gandhi and Rabindranath. See, these are two I think of them as the best products of Indo-British cultural encounter, and respect them deeply. But at the same time, and they are both critical of industrial civilization in their own ways, you know, Jantrik Shubhuta. But if you think of their lives, they were so dependent on fossil fuel. Because the major modes of transport, the train that took people to Bolpur and Shantaniketan, 
And Tagore made more than 80 trips, uh, most of them by steamships in his, in his life. His cosmopolitanism and Gandhi's travel and everything was the fossil fuel. So even they could not extract themselves from the fossil fuel economy. But that's, it's not a criticism, it's just the reality of the world they lived in. That's, that's very true, sir. Um, but uh, I guess if we continue, we can continue for a very, very long time. But I think it's, it's almost nine o'clock here uh, in the evening in India. Uh, and uh, let's just uh, keep some questions un unanswered because that okay, will give sure. us an opportunity to call you back. <laughs> and maybe next Thank time, you. if we are more lucky physically uh, to come Thank and you. visit us and speak to us, uh, uh, I guess on a more personal note, I guess. So thank you, sir, for uh, delivering a, a very interesting, fascinating, rather alarming, but I guess we need uh, uh, such propositions today to make us more conscious of who we are and where we move from here. Uh, I will now um, hand over the... Uh, I guess the, the virtual mic to our IQS coordinator, uh, Professor Shomrat Bhattacharji, to bring the proceedings to at the end and to deliver the vote of thanks. Um, thank you, Shrimoi. Uh, indeed, it is a pleasure to accord the vote of thanks. I will begin by expressing my gratitude to Professor Dipesh Chakraborty for accepting our request to be the speaker of the Alexander Duff Memorial Lecture 2020. Uh, thank you, sir, for that very illuminating and thought-provoking lecture. We are looking forward to seeing you personally in our college when we get over this pandemic situation. Please accept our token of appreciation and gratitude. Thank, thank you, you very much. My sincere thanks to our principal, Dr. Okita Mukherjee, for her warm welcome address and very critical inputs in organizing this program. Thank you, madam. A special token of appreciation to our vice principal, uh, Dr. Shukratin Das, who has played a pivotal role and has put, it, put in his utmost effort for staging today's program. Thank you, sir. I'm also reminded of all the other internal management committee members, the BASA, the Senate Secretary, the Teachers Council Secretary for their role in organizing today's webinar. My thanks to Dr. Srimoy Gohutha for very efficiently conducting the question and answer session. I will be failing in my duty if I do not mention the names of Sri Shushobhan Paul, from the Department of Physics, and two of our faculty members from the Department of Computer Science, Sri Orun Kumar Chakraborty and Sri Mutin Vedita Shaha, for rendering all their assistance, including the virtual platform support. Finally, I'm grateful to all our participants, the academicians, the administrators, directors and curators, civil service officers, researchers, faculty members, and the students for their gracious presence, without which this web webinar would not have been a success. You have been a lovely audience. In the end, my sincere apologies for any inconvenience which might have been caused during the course of organizing or conducting this webinar. Before I end, a warm greetings to all of you from the entire Scottish Church College family for the ensuing Christmas season. And do take care of yourselves and others. Thank you all once again for being part of this wonderful evening. Um, and uh, I guess we should also extend our thanks to our uh, IQAC coordinator, Professor Hortachaji, as well. Uh, thank, thank you, you Shobrada, as always. Uh, you have been an organizer for excellence, impeccable organization. And I might as well add the question that came from SCC, I think, belongs to our very own Professor Shushobon Pal from the Department of Physics. Sorry, Shushobon, for not recognizing you there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Deepesda. Thank you. Thank you.